What's up guys? Welcome back to the channel for the second day in a row. Much like yesterday, we just got done recording today's upload. This the raw review for 42224, which you guys will be seeing and hearing in just a few moments. But just like yesterday, once we were done recording this raw review, we find out there's more releases from WWE. This one is a big one. Cameron Grimes has officially been released by the company Cameron Grimes himself confirming this with an emotional message, a post on his own behalf. This is a dude that WWE was very high on at one point. He was supposed to be a pivotal part of this company going forward, uh, involved in some epic matches, moments, segments, stories down in NXT, and he was never given even a chance on the main roster. That's the weirdest part of all of this. Cameron Grimes has the charisma, the personality. He can put storylines on his back, really good on the microphone, can carry really good wrestling matches, and this dude was just released. So this isn't just... These releases are very odd. It's just some of these some of these individuals were supposed to be a big part of the company's future and not even given a chance. It's very odd. Uh, Von Wagner is one thing. Cameron Grimes is an entirely different story. He was supposed to be and should have been a big time player already. They brought him up, put him on the shelf. You thought it was just a VKM thing. And then to see that HHH didn't see anything in him. We got to find out a lot more. Unfortunately, as I have been telling you guys since last Friday, when the first round of releases came out involving Zia Lee, Jinder Mahal, and others, I told you guys that was not the end. Then we found out about Wagner. We're finding out now about Cameron Grimes. And I will say the same thing. Unfortunately, there are more names, uh, probably some that have already been released. We just don't know about them yet. So that's an update. We just finished the raw recording and I found out this news. So I'm putting this at the top of the review. Now let's get to the review. Oh, they did it. They did the deed. Becky Lynch is your new women's champion. If you guys were the booker, if you were running the creative in WWE, you got your crayons, you got your posty notes. And you have to decide between Becky Lynch and Liv Morgan. Who do you who do you go with? Who who who? Do you go Becky Lynch like they decided last night, or do you put that title on Liv Morgan, even though Rhea could be gone for several months? Was that the time to put that title on Liv Morgan in that battle royal, or do you think no harm, no foul? Give it to Becky. Maybe in the future, Liv will have her moment. What do you do if you were the head of creator? That's that's the question because Paul Levesque McMahon. WWE decided to go big time Bex. And that was a big decision because there was a lot of backlash. And I'm not talking about the PLE next Saturday. A lot of people upset about that. You thought they were upset when Sammy defeated Chad Gable to catapult Sammy into the IC title match at Mania. This, this made that look like a little cupcake. This was the entire wedding cake last night, man. Becky Lynch. What's causing all of this is what Nature Boy Ric Flair used to say. What's causing all? Becky Lynch is causing this. That was a massive decision. We're going to talk all about it. Um, where are my manners? Allow me to introduce myself. I am B, mother can see the Amplify Man. And this is your raw review for 42224. Becky Lynch ends this show in one of her biggest moments of her career as Pyro is going off, celebrating with fans and a new shiny gold championship high above her dome piece. We're going to talk all about it as Liv Morgan loses another heartbreaker. We're also going to talk... Instead of as Drew McIntyre looks at Sheamus and says, you used to be about banger after banger, but now you're just about burger after burger after burger. He did not. And that set off a lot of outrage. They said that dude's body shaming. Body shaming. Paul Levesque McMahon. Drew McIntyre, WWE, receiving a lot of backlash from a lot of woke individuals who are not happy. We'll talk all about it in this review. There was a heel turn last night. Well, they were already heels. 
But Kaiser was not a face, trust me. So I guess they kind of catapulted Vinci into a face? Either way, Kaiser had his Shawn Michaels moment last night. A huge turn. And BC's going to tell you why this was so well done. And talking about tag teams turning on one another, Tommaso Ciampa, seeds were planted for a possible turn on John Gargano. We're going to talk about that as well. Gunther returns. A lot to discuss. There's no time left in this cold open. There's so much to talk about. I'm going to drink a lot of my coffee. You guys are going to the opening electric signature. Come on back, and we're going to talk Raw 422-24. Sound good? Let's get ample of So this Raw 422-24 kicks off with Jey Uso and Damian Priest face-to-face promo. Damien eludes to the notion that Jay is just another tag team guy. Basically, he'll be the first domino to fall in his title reign. And I like how Damien, I'll paraphrase a little bit, but he said something to the effect of, you're just the first to be fed by the machine to me. Basically, it's the Roman Reigns title reign, right? Where the machine, WWE, was pumping out one individual after the other to face Roman. But when it was said and done, they were basically just fed to Roman. They never really had a chance. When it was all said and done, no matter how it was done, they were looking up at the lights. No matter how badly they needed a W, they were collecting L's. So I love how he said, basically, the machine, like like he's the chosen one now. The machine is pumping out people like Jay Uso to be fed to him. I love that line. Jay Uso responds, saying, tough talk from the big bad leader of the Judgment Day. But the only reason you're now the leader is because Rhea Ripley got injured. This obviously popped the crowd. Jay continues, saying, I guess that makes you Dominic's biatch. He didn't exactly say biatch. Another pop from the crowd. (laughs) So uh, basically inserting that, are you true? Questioning, are you truly the leader of this group? And that was pivotal because later in the night, Damien would have to prove that he is. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So McDonuts then hits the ring. JD McDonuts. He hits the ring. I have no idea what happened next. I blinked. Damien was on the canvas, I believe. McDonuts had this like Steve Urkel look on his face, you know, like, then I knew that. Like, like he did something and he accidentally maybe distracted Damien to where he got. I, I think they said there was like a super kick. Something happened, Damien got taken out or something, and, and McDonald's was standing there like, maybe I should not have come to the ring. <laughs> maybe this wasn't a good idea. Should have stayed in the little clubhouse. So, no harm, no foul. Uh, but pretty de- What was good about this segment, uh, something about Damien and Jey Uso feels fresh. That's the good news, right? It just feels like something that, all right, if this is done correctly, this could be a lot of fun. The flip side to that is, Both still have a long way to go to be like a main event. Like, I know we call him main event Jay. I know he's been in some main events. Damien's got the championship right now, the the, the heavyweight. But they still have a long way to go booking-wise and to make us truly feel like their main event status. So, as fresh as this is, and I like it, this could easily be for like the US championship, the IC championship, right? Or just no title on the line, just a... Just a a little fun story, but a a match in the mid card. This could easily be that. So they still have a long way to to go to sell this match like it is something at the top of the card. And this was a good step, I feel. I think the good news is it can happen, right? It's something that is possible, at least. It's going to be interesting to see how they insert Jimmy back with Jay eventually, because that's going to have to happen as we get through the summer, especially in the Survivor Series. You're going to have to have the new bloodline with the old bloodline. And at this point, is Jay going to be weighed down by Jimmy, right? Jay's doing very well on his own. Jimmy, not so much. Jimmy's going to benefit by reconnecting with his brother. Jay, man, I hope he's just not... Just as he said last night in the promo, just the other Uso, because that's how Damien and so many look at him. 
as such. Anyway, I don't want to go too in-depth with that. That was the opening segment. No harm, no foul. The ending was a little weird, a little cringe with McDonuts inserting himself for no real reason. Um, And then I blinked and it was over, basically. We were into commercial. So the first matchup of the night was the tag team title match. This was Awesome Truth versus DIY. And I have a little bit of an issue before the match even started. Let me get a swig of coffee and I'm going to I'm going to nitpick for like a minute, all right? It's a production nitpick, but it it has to be said. I hope we don't do this every single time there's a title match. So I love that production is trying new things, right? I I love that, right? We've been seeing every single week now, we see that long, steady cam one shot from the parking lot or the locker room, and we follow the wrestler through the gorilla position and out the curtain, or we're up in section 320 in the concourse, and we go through the curtain and we see the arena. Very nice, right? We don't want to wear it out and do it every week, but it's their shiny new toy, and they're going to wear it out every week. Uh, but I love the uh, a lot of the production that's been going on. But in these introductions for the tag titles, man, they did these extreme close-up introductions. And I'm just not a fan. First of all, Samantha is beautiful. We all know that, right? And if you ever want to do a quick close-up to Samantha, ain't nobody going to have a problem with that. But there's no reason to have that much of a close-up on Samantha. Samantha's not going for the tag titles. Give her some space. I'm sure Samantha would like a little bit of room. (laughs) That was extreme. And then we get the extreme close-ups on both teams. Both teams extreme. And I like seeing all of the reactions, right? That's part of the fun when the challengers are being introduced. I I also want to look to my left and see how the champions are responding to, to the reception or lack thereof. Or the fact that they have to give them the moment to be introduced. Same with the champions. I want to see the challengers and how they're acting. What are they doing? Are they even acknowledging them or looking away? Like that's half the fun, seeing all of the reactions. I like that raw, natural feel during the introductions of a, of a title match. And this is a little too fancy here, guys. A little, I think we're getting a little too fancy. I think they all gathered around the, uh, <laughs> the, the boardroom table or just some random table in Stanford, Connecticut at the headquarters. And they were just like, production, man, let's just do all these nifty tricks. So they zoomed in. And if you guys saw, they blur out everybody in the background. So you don't see anybody. So it's supposed to give this visual like the character is really popping off the screen, right? They do it with MLB. All the sports are doing it now. Um, Fox has gotten carried away with it. But in some circumstances, it's cool, right? The character is really popping. It's, it's cool. And everything else behind them is kind of blurred out. So it gives almost like a little 3D approach or something. I get it. But that close up, man, we want to see. You still got to keep that raw, natural, gritty feel to the program, right? Like, just do a wide shot. Or if you're going to do the close-up, not the entire introduction. Like, also go wide so we can also get the reaction of the other team or the other individual. Get the crowd's reaction as they're introduced. You know, it was just, the whole introduction was just extreme close-up Samantha, extreme close-up to DIY, extreme close-up to Awesome Truth, referees holding up the title. That's my nitpick. Thank you. That's my minute of nitpick. That's the only thing I'll nitpick, all right, for this match. (laughs) But it has to be said. I hope we don't do that for every single introduction, man. The extreme close-up. That is way too produced. Overly produced. There is nothing raw to that raw feeling. Or raw segment, I should say. There's no raw feeling to that raw segment. So let's get to the match, all right? How did the match come across? Well... Glad you asked. Awesome truth, as we believed, as the only outcome that could have been could have been had. Awesome truth defeats DIY. The only surprise here to BC was they had Miz pin Gargano like clean. So this was one of VKM's boys, Miz, pinning clean one of HHH's boys, Gargano, and that like caught me by surprise a little bit. Uh, I mean, uh, 
awesome truth has to win. So, I mean, Tommaso and Gargano, one way or the other, one of them was losing. I get it. I thought there'd be a little bit more to save face on Gargano and Tommaso. Just wasn't the case, man. Um, Post-match mutual respect. They shake hands. But Tommaso wants no part of it. I loved it. No mutual respect. Stop with the faces versus the faces. And when the match is over, everybody shakes hands. You know, last week, they did the hug and the shake hands, and then Gable turned on Sammy. This week, Tommaso wants no part of it. We're seeing just a lot of this lately, a lot of turns or teasing of turns, right? Tommaso looked at Johnny and was like, dude, are you serious? No. And he leaves the ring. So there was like a little bit of a tease that they could split. Now, if if I'm writing this, they definitely have to split. DIY lost another championship match. At this point, they're not just racking up losses. They're racking up losses in championship matches. How many opportunities are you going to give them before fans are looking at them like absolute clowns? And you don't got to worry. We're far away from that because fans don't even care about DIY enough to think that they're losers. That's the even sadder part. They have not booked DIY to the point where fans even care about them. Wild, man. And, you know, I brought up the point in yesterday's upload that Miz is from Ohio, Cleveland, I believe. I forgot where they were. Columbus, Cleveland. But he's, I mean, he was going to get heavily cheered. A lot of you guys told me, no, Gargano is too, though, BC. Well, they didn't care last night because they were heavily, firmly behind Awesome Truth, and they did not care about DIY. So my point is, they have to split them up anyway. I wouldn't even have Tommaso do this heel turn. You got the draft coming up. Let them go their separate ways. In the future, hopefully, when both are built up properly and they ever come back together, people will care enough to watch Tommaso and Johnny. But at this point, if you're just going to do a heel turn, and you're going to start this feud between Johnny and Tommaso with nobody already caring about either... Man, you got to work 10 times as hard, and you know WWE is not going to work that hard on that feud. I'd rather see them, if they're going to do a feud with Johnny and Tommaso, because we already know how good that can be, because we've seen it in the past, NXT. But if you're going to do it, you got to do it properly. Don't rush it, because we saw what happens when you rush it, especially with these two. They rushed into a DIY reunion when I told you guys there was no reason to have a DIY reunion. Pump up Tommaso, pump up Johnny. In the future, if you ever want to do something cool with them, cool. But make sure they're both established. They both had nothing. Nobody cared about them. They put them together, and people cared about them even less. We could go on and on with the DIY side of things, but let's flip over to Awesome Truth. Not too much bad you can say on that first real title defense by that team, because when you beat Tommaso and Johnny in your first title defense, it's pretty damn solid, man. So that's your first match of the night. Title match, DIY defeated, Gargano pinned by Miz, and Tommaso wants no part of the post-match mutual respect handshake. Good. I hope every wrestler in that locker room understands whether you're friends with one another or not. Stop with the handshakes afterwards. This isn't collegiate wrestling, man. There's titles on the line. Chad Gable, he understood last week. Tommaso understands this week, and hopefully they continue to understand. You lose, just get out of the ring, hit the showers, do better next time. Um, Next, Gunther returns to Raw. Is Gunther going to mingle around with the mid-card, or is he going to the mountaintop? Is he going to now go to the main event scene? Let's talk about what Gunther had to say last night. Gunther returns. He declares himself the first real name in the King of the Ring. Again, I believe that's Saudi Arabia. Is that June or is that the Clash at the Castle? June or July, one of the two. Um, or end of May. End of May? Like, I, there's three. WWE was trying to pump, advertise three PLEs in one night last night. You have Backlash next Saturday in France. You have Clash at the Castle. You have, and that's like an Ireland or Scotland, one of those countries. And then you have, so Clash at the Castle, Backlash, and then you also have King of the Ring, Queen of the Ring, which is Saudi Arabia, I believe. And all three are coming up within the next couple of months. And they were trying to advertise for all three last night. So anyway, Gunther declares himself 
um, an entrant into the king of the ring, or he's, do you, do you have to qualify? Do you, is there going to be a qualifying tournament to get into the tournament? Who knows? <laughs> now, I do see this dude winning it, right? It makes the most sense. And he says when he wins it, uh, and, and I guess I should set it up properly, New Day ended up hitting the ring. Not really sure why. New Day just wanted some airtime, so they came out. And Woods was talking about how he knows about being king of the ring. So Gunther was like, no, no, no. I'm going to be like the real king of this ring when I win. I'm not just going to put on some stupid little robe and carry this stupid dumb scepter and and, and, and the, the little, little Burger King crown, whatever he said, and play the role of a king. He says, I'm going to bring prestige back to the king of the ring. So... I just feel like they're positioning Gunther to be a true, regal, prestigious king of the ring. I don't see how anybody's going to take him off that pedestal. Gunther more than likely will will win that tournament. Um, Other than that, Gunther didn't say too much. He just talked about like no matter which title he decides to go for, um, he's going to win it. And he says that could be the U.S. title, it could be the IC title, it could be the WWE heavyweight, the world. Um, That's not what I wanted to hear, man. You know, you take some time off, you come back, and you're ready for that main event scene. You're ready to take on names like Randy Orton, Seth Rollins, CM Punk, Cody Rhodes, LA Knight. The main event scene is waiting for you. There's no reason to go back to fighting Tazawa or Bronson Reed or Ricochet. No reason whatsoever. I wanted a little bit more definitiveness out of him. I didn't quite get that. But the King of the Ring announcement, him winning it, makes total sense. As far as the New Day being out there, this just led to a rematch of a rematch of a rematch of a long-lost rematch of a rematch of a rematch between Imperium, Kaiser, and Vinci versus Kofi and Xavier. So we just got that tag match yet again. Um, New Day wins. After pretty long, I think it was like two commercial breaks. They gave this match some time. Crowd, crowd couldn't care really less. Um, it was just a match we've seen so many times that I believe we know the sequences before they even happen. <laughs> but New Day wins this thing. Gunther's not happy. He was at ringside. And uh, he was not happy about this, so he just takes off. He leaves them right there. And Kaiser, uh, this is post-match. Kaiser is consoling Vinci. Vinci is the one who I believe ate the, or took the L and took this pin. So Kaiser is consoling him. You know, that's his tag team partner. Gunther's pissed, but they're going to get through this together. So he helps Vinci up. And you kind of think, is he going to turn on him? But then they get out of the ring. So you're thinking it's a little less likely now. And, but you still have this thought, like the way he's acting, it's like he's going to turn on him. And then Michael Cole just starts like winding down the segment, like they're about to go to something else. So everything was beautifully done for the moment when Kaiser took Vinci and slingshotted him backwards. Don't piece first into the LED board apron. So that apron, you know, it's LED board now. And he just cracked his dome piece into it, turns on Vinci. Everything about this was just done brilliantly. Puts a post-match beatdown on Vinci. Puts him against the steps or leans him on the steps. He's about to like, uh, I don't know what he was going for. Separate a shoulder, crack a neck, who knows. But he was going to do something. All these suits and ties came down. Finally got Kaiser off of Vinci. But Vinci's able to escape, runs around the ring, and catapults himself into Vinci, into the steel steps. Vinci is destroyed. The crowd is, is chanting, holy shit. It was so well done. So well done, man. And for Kaiser, this was his Shawn Michaels moment. It just was. right. This was his Shawn Michaels moment. It was clear this dude's ready to roll. Just like his girl, uh, IRL, Tiffany Stratton. They're dating in real life. And, and I think that's pretty cool how Kaiser's now going to get the chance to shine. Kaiser's going to get a chance to show if... If it's a sink or swim type scenario, is Kaiser a dude that can hold gold in that company? Is Kaiser a dude that can carry storylines? Is Kaiser a dude that can elevate not just himself, but others to the mountaintop? Or is he just destined for the mid card or opening up cards? Destined to have some house show matches. This is Kaiser's time. 
And if you do another year with him and Vinci, it's just a disservice and an injustice to Kaiser. On the flip side, this is this is going to be Vinci's Marty Janetti moment. And it's sink or swim. Marty Janetti would have been fine after Michaels broke up uh, the tag team of the Rockers. Janetti would have been fine. Janetti ended up being his own worst enemy. Janetti got in his own way. But Janetti would have been absolutely fine. It, you're not trying to equal Shawn Michaels' status or stature in the company or his goals or wherever he's doing. You're trying to carve your own path, do your own thing. Being a Marty Janetti in a tag team is now looked at like a bad thing. But Marty Janetti was incredible. So now it's also Vinci's time. Sink or swim, make sure you swim and swim flawlessly. Is Vinci just a dude that's good with tag teams because he lacks charisma and personality? Or does Vinci have the utmost in personality and kick-ass charisma? Now's the time for Vinci to shine? Or is he just going to fade away into the shadows. Now is the time for Vinci to step up or just sit down. But you can't be clogging up a roster spot. And as far as the tag team division, it's already non-existent. Teams like Imperium, if booking is not going to get behind them and fans don't care about them, then we're just repeating the same redundancy into the ground. I like this split up. Then we did that one shot where you you follow Kaiser to the back and Gunther is waiting there in Gorilla with a smirk. And Kaiser says, you know, I told you I would take care of it or whatever. And Gun- So it looks like Gunther and Kaiser will stick together. Not as a tag team, but they are going to stick together in some alliance. Maybe they get a third person. Again, this is a big moment for Vinci just like it is for Kaiser. People are going to look at Kaiser like the Shawn Michaels and the Vinci as the Marty Jannetty because that is the scenario. But that doesn't have to be a bad thing for Vinci. The way that this was done, executed, was flawless. Absolutely to perfection, even to Michael Cole, sounding like he was about to go to the next segment. Everything. Letting it breathe. Taking Vinci to the outside. Consoling him. And then wham, you're out of Imperium. So this is one of those things where, you know, back-to-back segments, you have two tag teams, DIY and Imperium, both, uh, both look to be splitting up. Imperium did split up, and then DIY, the seeds were planting for a separation, whether that's in the draft or Tommaso literally goes his own way. So huge back to back segments with major repercussions in the tag team division. That actually ended our number one, that big turn, by the way. So again, our one, you had the Jey Uso, Damian Priest pump up for their match at Backlash for the title. And then you had two big, um, two big scenarios in the tag team division. A tag title match where Tommaso went his own way last night. And then you had Gunther's return. But it was the tag division that was the headline in this segment with Imperium imploding. So... Pretty big newsworthy first hour. Hour number two would kick off with Drew McIntyre. This would collect a lot of headlines. Maybe not for the right reasons. A lot of people were upset with this promo. We'll talk all about it. So McIntyre comes to the ring. CM Punk chants. Drew sits CM Punk style once he hears that. I love that, right? You gotta listen... The old adage in pro wrestling, the best wrestlers know when to just stop. Even if they have pages of something planned and rehearsed, stop, listen to the crowd, and go accordingly. So Drew hears the CM Punk chant, so he says, I'm going to cut this promo sitting down. Love that. Just like Punk would do. CM Punk style, middle of the ring. Sheamus comes to the ring. Sheamus and Drew and I'm like I- I'm thinking like oh what are you doing here? are we going to rekindle this we've seen this 8,641 times slight exaggeration but only slight but then I was thinking okay clash at the castle they probably want Sheamus versus Drew if Drew's not going to be going for a title or holding a title I get it so I'm like oh just get this done with if you ain't going to have something cool so they do talk about their history a little bit and Drew, man, Drew is so good as a heel. He just he, he knows how to just take it easy, take a breath, let things just settle. And he's much more methodical, methodical in his words. And he just says, dude, I used to, we used to just beat each other up and then have a pint afterwards. 
That's not what I do anymore. Drew says, now I fight only when I need to, when it actually matters, when I care. And he says, and I just don't care about this. So he wants nothing to do with Sheamus. So Sheamus tries again to be like, man, what happened to you, Drew? You know, we, we were friends and this and that. And he's like, that's the thing. We were this and we were that. But look at you now. He goes, you used to be all about banger after banger after banger. And now you're just about burger after burger after burger. Because if you guys don't know, Sheamus' debut last week, he came in a little bit overweight, I guess. And on the social doohickey machine and, and the big chatter about Sheamus last week, all this week was about how he gained a lot of weight. He didn't, he hasn't been hitting the gym or something, but he's, he, he came back a lot bigger, right? So the story this week was about body shaming. Now you hear that a lot about with, with like females. You don't hear a lot about it with the dudes, right? I mean, when Ivar or Bronson Reed or Yoko Zuna back in the day, when they squashed you, they sat on you. We were talking about the dude is 600 pounds and he sat on a human. And when he got up, the human was, he was gone. Where's the human? <laughs> up his ass. Did he turn into pixie dust? Who knows, man? Check Yoko Zuna because the, the dude he sat on is gone. Right? And you weren't thinking, you were just saying what you saw. I mean, dude is massive. Now, and there was jokes being had, you know, but but nobody called it body shaming. So, you know, now in 2024, you know, you have a little bit of fun. Seamus was having fun with it, too, from what it looked like on the social doohickey. He was he was they were popping Seamus with some of these jokes. So and but but some, you know, 2024, it's a different society. It's a different world. And a lot of people were offended and outraged. I mean, outraged guys like furious that Seamus was being body shamed, they called it. So I guess that's, I mean, it's a thing. And I guess it's a thing for the dudes as well. I, we just, growing up around BC's time, we never really, we didn't think that way for the dudes. You know what I mean? If a dude was fat, he was fat. And we, we cracks up, especially if it was our boys, we'd have fun with it. And we'd, we'd make them crack up. That's just how we grew up. So, it's just different to see how everybody reacted to jokes, but I guess you, you just can't do that anymore. And, you know, I can see where the, the good in that, where stopping that does help a lot of people who maybe don't look at it as a joke, right? L like they don't think that it's funny. I can see that. So anyway, it was a big thing this week. No matter how you look at it, right? I mean, even BC taking a deep, deep dive into the thought there's so many moving parts to this, but they decided to use it, right? This was Paul Levesque McMahon saying, shut up, we're using it, it's going to be in the promo, and you can cry about it some more. This is Levesque McMahon saying, no, use the line. So he said, you're about burger after burger after burger, and that just ignited everybody again. And now everybody is even more outraged. How can you use that in a promo? That's not funny. But... But Drew McIntyre said it, dude. I, I, <laughs> I it popped BC, bro. Whether it was funny or not, I couldn't believe he said it. I, I'm not going to lie, man. He said burger after burger after burger. And Sheamus was cracking up, dude. Sheamus was cracking up. So if those that were offended, those that didn't like it, hey, your prerogative. I hear you. I hear you. But Sheamus was cracking up. Sheamus said it was pretty funny. So I guess... I guess it's in the eye of the beholder, right? These are two buddies, don't forget. These are two really good friends. And Drew, you know, cra like I just said, like if it's your boy, you're going to crack those type of jokes and you're going to have a little bit of fun. And if it's your boy, they're going to laugh with you, man. Um, But man, that ignited a lot of like backlash. Paul Levesque, McMahon, WWE, Drew McIntyre, they received a lot of backlash, a lot of heat uh, for that. But he said, you used to be about banger after banger. Now you're just burger after you're about burger after burger after burger. <laughs> Wild, bro. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> no, he did not tell me he didn't just say that. So Booker T this leads in the Sheamus defeating Shinsuke Nakamura with Drew at ringside. I thought Drew was going to take out Sheamus. Drew literally just sat on the commentary table, like leaning up against it. And just watched 
Sheamus defeat Shinsuke Nakamura. And that started our number two. So, trust me, you haven't seen the last of Drew and Sheamus, obviously. I do believe they're going to face each other for a clash at the castle. So, you just got to buy time for several months until you can get CM Punk back. And then you ignite Drew McIntyre, CM Punk. I just... You got to believe that the decision's being made not to put the title on Punk when he comes back. Maybe they do look at him as a little too brittle and they just want to see if he can last because the last several years, he hasn't wrestled that much and he's been getting injured a lot. He even got injured like just jumping into the crowd, like into the first row and he, he like broke something or it's, it's not been good. So he's basically falling apart. So they might not want to give him the championship. Because if that wasn't the case, Drew would have had the title, and you wait until Punk comes back and you set up that title match. Drew versus Punk. Now it looks like Drew has nothing to do with the title, and before you know it, Punk will be back. It looks like that match will have no title. There'll just be no title implications at all. Interesting to see where that's going, but I wanted a little bit more for Drew for the Clash of Castle, something a little bit more... Something more pivotal. Something more intriguing, um, rather than just doing a match we've seen 8,641 times. But, uh, I mean, maybe maybe they'll it'll be built up to, the, to a point where we, we want to see it, you know? Like, this will be the, the one we want to see more than any other ones in the past. We'll see. Pretty interesting segment. Like I said, that one line really ignited a lot of backlash for WWE. Backstage, Bronson Reed attacks Sami Zayn. That has great implications for the next segment, which was Chad Gable explaining why he turned on Sami last week. I like how this was done. Sami was not needed last night, especially before you kind of iron out who's going where for the draft. You really want to have a concrete plan for Sammy and Gable. So just rushing something for the sake of putting them both out there together. That's that's the opposite of what you're trying to go for. So they kind of wrote Sammy out off the show at that point when Bronson totally destroyed him backstage. So then Gable comes out. No matter what he says, Sammy's not coming out there. And what Gable said was a thing of beauty. This was Gable's moment. This was his calling card to everybody that doubted him or didn't look at him like a true viable top star in this company. Because what he did last night, great heel work on that microphone. Chad Gable in-ring promo with all of Alpha Academy. You got Tazawa, you got Maxine Dupree, you have Otis. Now Chad Gable says... How could he win that match last week? Slight paraphrasing, but how can he win that match last week when he was spending all his time trying to train a bunch of freaking losers? <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm training a bunch of freaking losers. And he looks at Tazawa, Maxine, and Otis. And at this point, uh, they are absolutely deflated. They're like, are you, dude, what are you saying? We're right here, brah. <laughs> Chad Gable goes on to say, and I quote, Tazawa, you come out here every week, you do your stupid dance, and you rack up loss after loss after loss. And Maxine, sweet Maxine, pretty as a princess, but dumber than a box of rocks. And Otis, you are, without a doubt, the biggest disappointment of them all. He then says from now on, the goal of Alpha Academy is to concentrate on Chad Gable and Chad Gable only, and on getting Chad Gable his IC title. He then makes all of Alpha Academy agree to the new mission. And by the way, too, he actually forced Otis on the microphone to fully oblige to the demands by, by saying, yes, whatever it takes, we will make sure you become IC champion, basically. And then Chad Gable still turned his back on all three of them, and he left the ring, leaving them high and dry, fully dejected, standing in the middle of the ring. So I thought that was just so well done. Props to Gable. And also props to Tazawa, Otis, and Maxine for playing their roles beautifully. Like, not only do they know no other way than without Gable, but they also probably feel like they owe Gable because Gable has spent so much time on them. So no matter how much of a dick he is, they feel like they do have to stick by his side. I just love that. And eventually, Gable will be so outrageously rude, crude, and just a dick that 
they're going to have to grow a backbone and, and ditch Gable. And that's just going to be such a cool moment. Hopefully it's done correctly. So very well done this segment. Then we went on to Anjorare and Ricochet versus Santos Escobar and McDonuts. Escobar replacing Mysterio. Dominic was in a sling at ringside. Again, Dominic Mysterio originally slated for this match, but Escobar takes his spot with JD McDonuts. Dom, you suck and shave your mustache chance. <laughs> so Dominic was getting a lot uh, of heat, even though he wasn't in this match. And that's a shame because these four gave it everything they had for nearly 15 minutes, but the crowd just wasn't into it like at all. Crowd was just pretty much sitting on their thumbs the entire match. Andrade would end up pinning McDonuts post-match. Damian Priest would hit the ring and he would lay out all the faces. He then turns to Dom Mysterio and McDonuts and Damian Priest says, I quote, I don't need anybody. You all need me. So this is what I mean when Jey Uso was questioning and making fun of his quote leadership in Judgment Day. Um, this was that was pivotal because I think at that moment J Damian Priest knew that he had to show people like Jey Uso that he is. And after he laid the faces out, something that McDonuts, Dominic, and Santos couldn't do. He did it by himself. He then looked at Dominic and McDonuts, his fellow Judgment Day members, and he said, I don't need you. Clearly, you need me. So I just thought that was so well done. And then Pat McAfee on commentary. Pat McAfee threw some salt into the wound of McDonuts. Uh, kicked a little dirt on top of JD McDonuts. Pat McAfee says, JD McDonuts couldn't get a win if his life depended on it. <laughs> There was no need for that, Pat. The dude was already down and out. He lost. He got degraded by, by Damien. <laughs> this was, Pat McAfee said this dude couldn't get a win if his life depended on it. Now, it is true. Uh, McDonuts is seven wins out of his last 30 matches. So if you do the Steiner math, that's what, 76, 76 to 77% of his matches he loses. 76 plus percent of his matches are lost. So yeah, that's not good. McDonuts wins loss record wise. Obviously it's not good, but you <laughs> look at the bright side. <laughs> it's better than Solo Sokoa's record. His last 40 matches, Solo Sokoa has a 100% losing record. Solo has lost his last 40 matches in a row. He is now headed toward 50. That is the new... Um, uncelebratory milestone that Solo Sokoa is going for. So in that aspect, McDonuts is damn good. Moving on, it is the main event. It's a battle royal for the ladies to decide the new women's champion. It was 14 ladies in this match. Nine got jobber entrances. Five got proper entrances. Those five being Beck Lynch, the Mon. Uh, also, Liv Morgan, Nia Jax, and Carter and Chance. They actually gave them a proper entrance, probably because they have that Ghostbuster entrance where they're blasting off their their uh, their packs. I forgot what you call those ghost packs. Uh, man, they were uh, they were called something. Anyway, I don't know. They're they're shooting off their their blaster packs there. So they gave them a proper entrance. The other nine ladies, they all got the jobber entrance. Now, how did this match go? Who won the championship? Was it the right call? Swig of coffee. We're going to talk about it. All right, so uh, let's get into the eliminations. I'll try to knock off actually every single elimination. I, I may have missed one, maybe two, but basically this is how it went down elimination-wise. Um, Maxine eliminates Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. Zoe Stark would then eliminate both Carter and Chance. Nia Jax eliminates Ivy Nile and Maxine. Becky Lynch eliminates Piper Niven. There was also a, a major table botch after Becky Lynch eliminated Piper Niven. Piper takes out Becky Lynch. Somehow Nia Jax gets involved as well. I don't know why she was out there. 
but they tried to do a spot where Becky goes through the commentary table and that would take her out till the end of the match or Becky plays this heroic individual that somehow crawls back in the ring after being taken out through the table and she wins this thing. The only problem was the table would not break. Nia tried to put Piper on top of Becky or something like that. It didn't break. So then you see the referees telling Nia, do it again, do something else. So then Nia tr- totally tries to do like a Samoan drop to Piper, which she almost didn't even get Piper up in that like fireman's carry position. And so she almost didn't even get Piper up, but she was able to finally get her up. They both backdrop on the Becky who was laid out on the table and the table still didn't somehow break. That's a combined, what, 4,500, something, man, and it did not break. We had to go to commercial. So now WWE is like, shit, that was the big send-off into the commercial. Becky threw the table. We botched it. So when we come back, we see Becky with a broken table. The, The table is shattered, and Becky's through it, and then Michael Cole has to go, during break, Becky was put through the table. And we see that, like, Piper, I believe it was, like, power-bombed Becky through the table. So that you know the table's going to break, right? So they, (laughs) one way or the other, uh, they finally put Becky through the table, but we were not able to see it. It happened during commercial break. So major botch there because that was the whole setup to Becky winning this thing. Back to the elimination. Zoe Stark eliminates Chelsea Green. Shayna Baszler eliminates Natty. Nia then eliminates Zoe Stark and Shayna Baszler. And at that point, it's between Becky Lynch, Nia Jax, Liv Morgan. Um, Becky would eliminate Nia Jax. And then Becky and Liv Morgan are your final two. The crowd in attendance was actually behind Becky. If you listen to the cheers, it was actually more Becky. The rest of the world, it seems, was behind Liv Morgan. (laughs) Heavily behind Liv Morgan. Becky Lynch would eliminate Liv Morgan and new women's champion, big time Bex, the man came around, Becky Lynch. And if you thought the outrage when Sami Zayn defeated Chad Gable to earn that IC title match at WrestleMania, if you thought that was like big outrage and people were pissed and they really thought it should have been Gable, guys, this was on a whole nother level. People were legit like, I don't understand this. It was clearly Liv's time. Becky's already had all these titles. Becky was going on vacation. Becky was taking time off. Then they bring her back to the European tour. They bring her back here because Rhea had to vacate the title. We heard word around the campfire because Triple H doesn't believe that there's that one big women star on Raw. So we brought Becky back early. But people were like, how is this a new era? It's just Becky again with a championship. Like this was the time. Liv gets it. Rhea rehabs, gets better when she comes back. It's the same feud with the same thing on the line, the title. It's just, it's reversed a little bit. Liv is now the champion. Rhea's going to go for it. But that's not what Paul Levesque McMahon felt was best. He's going Becky Lynch. Liv is going to have to wait if she gets it at all. Now, you can look at it as some would say, Liv Morgan, the only way this story can truly go off the way it should is Liv has to get that title from Rhea Ripley. If that's the case, you're asking for like a year-long thing. Somehow Rhea's got to come back, get it back from Becky or whoever's champ at that time, and then set up the live feud again. That could take nine months to a year when it's all said and done. And if we've learned anything from Cody and Roman a year ago at Mania, don't automatically assume you're going to get a certain match a year from now. Things change by the week, by the day, by the hour, by the minute, by the second. So if you think Liv is going to get it next year, I wouldn't count on that. So that's why a lot of people are upset. Like, this was the moment. Just give it to Liv. They gave it to Becky Lynch. I don't have a big problem with it. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'm, uh, I've been high on Liv Morgan. I just feel like she's getting better and better. And the crowd reaction to her is so good, which is still befuddling to me that after she won the title that last time, they turned on her so quickly. They jumped off the Liv Morgan bandwagon. And now we're starting to see the crowd get behind her again. And I just got to think, like, is that going to happen again? Is that what made WWE go, no, last time we put the title on her, you guys all jumped off. We ain't doing that again. You know, that may have scared WWE into not doing that again. But there is a lot of backlash over this, obviously. This is like a Chad Gable, Sami Zayn situation, but even more so. A lot of people really felt this was the time. I saw there was, you know, some people obviously going, man, this was lazy. This should have been a tournament to decide. This was just Triple H being lazy. 
How many tournaments are you, do you need? You, you got the king and queen of the ring coming up, first of all. So probably they didn't want to do another freaking tournament with the ladies. And then next month or in two months, do another whole women's tournament. How many tournaments do you need? Every single time we need a new champion or even just to crown a number one contender. We're doing these stupid tournaments all the time. Or, or several triple threats or fatal four-way tournaments, right? And the winner of this fatal four-way or this triple threat will face the winner of this triple threat and this fatal four-way. Stop! Let's just determine a new champion so we can set up really fun storylines. You would like two months of a tournament. I want two months of an epic storyline. So whoever Becky is facing, let's start something fun. I, nobody needs two months of another tournament where in five minutes somebody backstage has a freaking Sharpie pen... Or maybe a crayon and, some, and a posty pad. And they just start doing two months of television. They put down eight names or 12 names or 16 names. And they just fucking... Okay, and you're going to round this round. And then this round, this person wins. And then they'll take on this person. Then, and in five minutes, you have eight weeks of television. That's creative? No. Force them to get creative. Determine a new champion. I love it. Battle Royal, fine. Whoever's the last one standing, put a title on them. Now the fun begins. Give them a storyline. Not even just Becky who won it. Give Liv Morgan a storyline. Give Nia Jax a storyline. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. Everybody should have a story. But just telling it, oh, man, we need two months of a tournament to determine the new champion. No, we don't. You get a tournament every single month. Two, three, four tournaments a month. Stop. I look at it as the opposite of lazy booking. I look at it as finally somebody woke up and said, you know what, maybe we should stop the tournaments for a moment. We have a whole pay-per-view of tournaments in a couple months. How do you guys feel about Becky Lynch winning this thing, man? Should it have been Liv Morgan? Was that the time to put that title back on Morgan? Or uh, should it just be, do you wait? Do you wait for Rhea Ripley? And does Liv Morgan have to beat Rhea for the title? And if that's the case... Oof, you're really straddling that line, man, because you got to get to that point in the future. You don't know. A lot of things change. Injuries, a lot of these wrestlers, sometimes they catch lightning in a bottle momentum-wise and crowd reaction-wise, and, and you got to put the title on somebody else. Sorry, Liv. You were the plan eight months ago. It's wild, man, but that was Monday Night Raw. Becky Lynch celebrating, going through the crowd. She's hugging little fans and kids and fireworks, pyros going off. It was a pretty cool visual. This was one of Becky Lynch's biggest moments of her career. It's wild how wrestling works. She probably thought she was going home for several weeks, maybe months. Just a week ago, she didn't even have a full-fledged WWE contract. We, we expected her to stick around, but the, the, the I still needed to be dotted. The T still needed to be crossed. So she didn't really have a definitive WWE contract last week. She was going to go home for a while. And here she is with obviously a new contract, a championship, and one of her biggest moments. Becky Lynch closes the show in a mega moment on Monday Night Raw. A lot of things happening last night, man. You have the heel turn of Kaiser on Vinci. You have the heel tease of Tommaso on Johnny Gargano. You got Gable talking exactly why he lost that match. Because he was too busy training idiots. And from here on out, the one mission of Alpha Academy is to help Chad Gable. That's an interesting scenario. You got Damien Priest trying everything imaginable to show that he is the real leader. That's going to lead to a lot of issues within that group. You have... Drew McIntyre, man, what he said to Sheamus and, and everybody rallying behind Sheamus and the body shaming. Be interesting to see where that goes now, man. Um, And then you have this women's division. Whew, Becky has the, man, mania. Becky was on, on her back looking up at the lights. Rhea was walking away with that title. Here we are just a few weeks later and Becky's hoisting up that title and Rhea's nowhere to be found. Wild. That's Raw 42224. Until next time. And there will be that next time. Top guys, we're out. BC saying check you. Peace.